Okay, recording. So today's session, we're here at the Open Source Microfactory Startup Camp. Today, we're going to discuss production engineering. A little bit about what production engineering means for 3D printing. So things like, what is printable? How do you print it? How do you assure a consistent quality control? And how can you do that in a distributed fashion? How do you assure quality control if you have a distributed production mechanism instead of centralized production? So let's, let's start with how 3D printing works so we can get a feeling of what's doable, what's not, what the current capacities are, and how that relates to some of the things we're printing right now or things we're working on right now. Let's begin with how 3D printing works in terms of the, the underlying physical mechanism. So obviously you're depositing layers of molten material. This is focusing on plastics. So focusing on plastics, molten material being deposited one layer upon the next. The way it works is that the molten layer that, that is ejected melts into the layer before, underneath it. So this is not about uh, the layers below remaining molten so that the layer on top can adhere to it, which is uh, actually same as if you take welding. Uh, in welding, you're welding upon cold steel. The melt of the wire or the electrode deposits and fuses into the layer below of the metal. In plastic, it actually works the same. So you don't require the fact that the layer below be kept molten in order for the print to succeed. In fact, you can quit a print for a day, for a month, and resume it, and it will still continue printing if you, uh, because you are melting into layers below it. So that's an important feature to remember as you think about 3D printing, because that will give you insight to, to its possibilities. So one. Uh, one big thing about 3D printing is like what objects can you print? There's some things that are just physically impossible, so, like uh, or not necessarily physical, physically impossible, but challenging. Like for example, if you're using a 3D printer to deposit plastic, you're de typically depositing upon a previous layer. But what if you're going over the edge? There's gravity, so the plastic would droop, and you can't print. That's that's the idea of overhangs. If you've got like an overhang on a house. If you're going to keep going out with the 3D printing filament, you can see you're going to droop, it's going to fall down, you have nothing to support the filament. And therefore, typical rule of thumb for 3D printing is that you, if you're going up in printing, you cannot overhang more than like at a 45 degree angle. Uh, that's a general rule of thumb, but I think we can, we can push that uh, at the limit where if you're depositing, say, say you're using uh, larger nozzle like 0.8 millimeter uh, and you want to get a little better than a 45 degree slant on a print going upwards uh, I would imagine you can you can push the limits to relatively easy uh, to, to be about 30 degrees uh, or call it 30 or 60 degrees so a little more more horizontal um, and I would also propose um, thinking out of the box that you can print in midair how? If you speed down, slow down, slow down to, to very, very low speed and increase, just blow the heck out of that in terms of a cooling fan. So, so 3D printers have cooling fans. Uh, that's a feature that allows you to solidify what you've just printed more rapidly so you can be more flexible in how you print. So I think it could possibly be doable that you're printing in mid-air. And there's actually evidence that you can do that. I'll show you that. But think about the idea where you're printing, but you're cooling it down so fast that you're able to do it in midair. Because the, the deal there is with molten plastic, of course, it droops. But if, if you can solidify it quickly enough, you might think that, that that could even be possible. There's an example to show you. So, so a 3D printed coil spring, as an, as an example, uh, let me take a look at um, 3D printed springs. Now let me plug into the internet here actually for some faster load times. Um, and let me share my screen as well. Now 
also share uh, sharing the screen. Uh, 3D printed springs. Springs. This is an example of what I mean by printing in the mid air. Um, take a look at this link. Look at these things. So, so what's happening here is that you're printing with nothing supporting underneath, like going mid air. Here's an example. So what you're doing is printing very, very slowly and cooling it fast enough that you're literally doing three-dimensional printing without underlying support. And I'm sure there could be, look at that, that's, that's the result. I'm sure there could be ways to optimize and play with it, experiment so that this is doable uh, essentially for doing things like prints in midair, I mean, to some extent. I mean, definitely if you have very, very strong fans, you can think how this could be possible. But getting just the right parameters to make this happen would be quite tricky, so a lot of experimentation. Uh, but I think there's limits we can press on that. So while the generic limitation is about 30, 45 degrees for the general rule of thumb, I think we can uh, we can probably do better and push those limits. Um, give you an example, 0.8 millimeter nozzle, even printing 45 degrees is very difficult. Um, so, but the question there is the layer height. H how high are you going between the layers? When you're printing it with a particular nozzle size, the limit that you have is typically about 75% of the nozzle, the the nozzle diameter as far as what the layers you're printing on as far as the maximum height you can separate the layers so for example printing with a 0.4 nozzle the max layer height you can get is about 0.3 because you need the next layer to adhere to the one below it if you if you made the nozzle the layer height 0.4 same as the nozzle you're barely touching one layer to the next so you got to do at least 75% uh, or lower so in the case of printing with 0.8 millimeter filament and you're trying to go, go at 45 degrees, we've seen examples where that just simply fails if you're using a layer height that's about 75% of the filament width. But if you go down to about 50% layer height, so at from going from 0.8 on a 0.8 millimeter nozzle going down to 0.4 layer height that actually made really nice perfect prints we've just been doing that here with uh, uh, in a 3d uh, 3d printed torch table parts where we have a 45 degree angle uh, so basically if you do 50 percent you get the slightly tighter layer height you can get back to more aggressive overhangs with larger nozzles so say you're printing with one point a 1.2 millimeter nozzle you definitely need a lot of cooling fans uh, probably a couple of cooling fans the blower 5015 blower fans but uh, if you decrease the layer height I think you can probably haven't really played too much with it but if you rec decrease the layer height you can probably print very effectively with 45 degree overhangs and even more aggressive overhangs even at the very large nozzles because the larger the nozzle the more heat the more droop when you're going over the edge it's heavier it, it will want to fall down on you more readily so you have to get uh, account for that um, so cooling fans, yes, cooling fans are a normal part. If you, if you use a printer without cooling fans, you'll be limited, like the overhang stuff, things will be more droopy. Um, so you do want a cooling fan. Let's talk about uh, overhangs between supports. So if you're going in midair but you're ending up on a point that's supported, that actually tends to do pretty well. So you could do 3D printed bridging. Um, if we Google 3D printed bridges you can do quite well bridging 3d printed bridging uh, this is a good example here let me uh, share my screen again here you'd think that this is nest hub and that's a photo of Sorry about that. Um, so here's an example of bridging so Printing b between two supported sides, that's definitely doable. So this is a good video that shows this. Uh, but here you have two structures and if you span between them, yeah, you can pretty much do it uh, without any support in between. 
Uh, so that's something to consider if you've got supports on both sides. It's quite well doable in many cases, uh, but even though you're spanning large distances. So uh, take a look at that as an example. Um, what's printable using the effects of, of uh, like when you're printing in midair between two points? For example, if you're printing uh, lines fast, you can take advantage of the phenomenon of, of uh, stringing, the idea that when you don't use retraction, so, you, so when the filament pushes one direction, yes, that's typically how you 3D print, uh, there's a retraction step in 3D printing where if you retract, that means you don't get oozing out of the nozzle tip because there's molten plastic in there. Now, if you disable retraction, you will have oozing, in other words, a small drip of plastic that, that oozes from the tip, and if you move fast, you can take, use that to an advantage. So you can print bristle, like actually really fine uh, stringy features which correspond to, to things like brushes or even fine brushes. Let's, let's show an example of that. So 3D printed brush. You can print 3D print brushes. Um, by doing this kind of uh, phenomenon, either where you're doing stringing or just, uh, let's see, good, a good example. Um, that's going to be on my 3D printed brush. Broom. I can't find it here. 3D printed broom. The, the idea that you've got single fibers that are printed like this thing right here <clears throat> entire broom with a 3D printer so this is actually doable uh, so you have to get good at this but look at the fineness of this of the bristles here and that oh, I should actually save this link I'm gonna star that that's a nice nice link but you can print the handle you can print how do you print the bristles it's it's got the effect of the, the stringing effect that I mentioned where you go between a um, two supports you can bridge them and you get these very fine fine hairs or you can apply the principle of stringing where you're not really pushing out a lot of filament but pretty much letting it ooze out so you get very very fine features and you can see that by mistake from time, to, that's exactly what it is. It's bridging between two uh, two solid parts, and then you cut that, cut that off. But you will definitely have some experience with with uh, oozing and and stringing on a 3D printer when you do that. But think about creative ways to tap that for your advantage. If you do very fast motion uh, with oozing, so that's essentially re disabled retraction. Uh, going fast between two points, you can produce very, very fine hairs. So where would that be used? Uh, a very fine brush. Like this is a pretty rough brush, and it's probably where the you are printing between the two to support points. But if you disable printing and just let the slight ooze happen, or just uh, just print a very, very low flow of plastic, then you get very, very fine features. And that's to be optimized. Like, I guess the slicers, I mean, there was a specialized brush making slicer, the, the thing that takes your SDL files, um, converts that to G code for printing. Uh, there could be some work there where we're optimizing 3D prints for brush printing and that becoming a very practical thing. Like, you know, take a, a brush for sweeping your workshop or a toothbrush or a fine fine brush for other purposes so yeah this it's pretty amazing you can you can do exactly this uh, not a problem I mean this is uh, between two supports um, like you see here but this I mean this is just pretty amazing if you take a look at that so pretty fascinating but I'm always looking for creative ways where you can use 3d printing to do things that are otherwise not doable uh, using other you know, what you think would not be doable in 3d printing uh, so let's talk about the next topic of production engineering. So production engineering means uh, what can you print, how do you print it, and how do you print it replicably. Let's talk about bed area extension. So if you have a small printer, say an 8 by 8 inch bed, uh, you there are actually techniques where which you can use 
to extend your print bed size. What if you want to print the control panel? <laughs> Let's start with an example. Control panel for the 3D printer. So uh, go to the D3D uh, 1906 version and in a CAD we have um, the control panel and the way we print it is so it's a panel uh, yeah let's show that on a video uh, so we're actually getting into a concept let's take a look at this so that's our control panel upon which uh, we hang all our electronics look at that it's a bend so if we have an 8 inch bed and you want to print something that's 12 inches what we do is we put this on a table like this, put a heat gun to it, and this basically falls down so it extends to the full 12 inches. So you can use this kind of a technique and that gets into four dimensional printing where we have a seam in between uh, like holes that are designed into this so that it bends very easily when you heat it. But the idea is print things that are bent so that you can straighten out in the temporal dimension like after the print. So that adds the fourth dimension which is time so that's called 4D printing, but that's one technique whereby you can take a very small um, small print bed and print objects that are larger than your print bed itself. What about some other techniques? If you if you want to print a dome uh, that's 30 feet diameter on a printer, how do you do that? Well, you can print connectors and then use, say, PVC pipe in between the connectors. So that's a way to make very large structures. Or think about what if you're printing um, like EPDM or rubber roofing or uh, water barrier. So you can print in rubber, but what if you wanted to print large long sheets? Well, how about printing it as a spiral going up on a bed? So you print out, say, a, you know, like a, you got a printer that can print up to one foot, you can print a roll that's already coiled up and that would unroll say 10 or 20 or 30 feet uh, because if, if printing just one layer it could be very tiny so think about even printing like a 50 foot roll on a one foot printer bed that would be an interesting thing to do um, and then to get things that are bigger than your printer think of Legos that's modularity concept print blocks that you make into much larger structures on the just to show you D3DV 1906 that's our control panel uh, so we hang all the electronics on it like this, but yeah, it's, it's made, it's printed on a bed in a bent form. Next. There is, for 3D printer production engineering, there are some unique, unique features of 3D printing that, like one thing about 3D printing is that you can't do with anything else. There's certain geometries that are simply impossible by other machining means, like for example, internal, inside features in an object. Since you're printing layer by layer, you can't, for example, just take a piece of metal object and, say, with a mill, mill internal features. Like, how are you going to get the bit inside on the internal side of an object? You can't. So with 3D printing, you can do that. Another very useful, uh, unique feature about 3D printing is the idea of printing things in place. Like, for example, planetary gears. Gears that are meshing, you print them with a very small separation. So um, you know, take a look at, let's share my screen again, 3D printed planetary gears, which, so 3D printed planetary gears is a great example, but these kinds of things you can print, like for example this, uh, well a thing like this for example, a gear, um, you know, many examples here, you can print all of these gears with a very small spacing right on a print bed as one piece so you don't need to take print multiple print this gear and more gears separately you can do them all as one the advantage of that being you can you can print herringbone so let's take a very special example of a gear that you cannot print in multiple pieces unless you start breaking things apart but um, 3D printed herringbone, uh, what's it called, a double herringbone, gear, which is a herringbone that's, uh, it's like this, it's, a, it's got angles, angled one way and then angled another way. Uh, if you were to 
print a planetary gear like this with you cannot put them into each other if you were to put them into place but you can print that print a planetary gear system that's made of these complex geometries if you print that as one piece simply by leaving a small gap between the 3d printed pieces so that they mesh just about uh, as needed so that's a, that's a unique feature of 3d printing another unique thing that you can print is yeah once again related to internal features but cavities like with large like for us we we think a lot about uh, house materials like whole panels for a greenhouse or a house so with 3d printing because you can print internal cavities think about a wall panel for modular construction or say you you print the glazing out of polycarbonate you print other parts that have plumbing or electrical fittings or conduits within the panels themselves so you've just built like insulating properties cavities utilities into a single panel that's a very good use case for 3d printing production engineering where you can have different internal features that are pretty much impossible to print otherwise you have things already built in so t take two panels connect them to one another you would have water or electrical conduits maybe you run a wire through the conduits but the waters water water conduits if you have uh, printing of both plastic and rubber in the same print you can print like internal built-in uh, o-rings that you can put these panels together for watertight connection as an example of building plumbing utilities right within the wall section uh, that gets into the multi-material printing where uh, printing plastic or rubber that gets you a lot of different possibilities like shoes think about shoes uh, a dual nozzle printer which can print plastic and then rubber so you get uh, plastic rubber or leather like materials uh, for printing shoes that's a great use case of how multiple materials that are fused to each other so no assembly it's like you're printing all those things next to each other uh, bonding into each other so that this is all automated quite could be quite exciting um, the current capacity of of multi-material printing is um, uh, another thing we think about here like say you're printing rubber you can print tires that's doable on larger printers of course the filament cost as I mentioned in another session is you, you have to have access to low-cost filament but you can get resin for about a dollar a pound uh, raw resin for like rubber or, or anything so you can be printing tires multi-material printing what about uh, printing the rubber and then embedding a, a metal wire yesterday we were looking at spring steel and we found that you can get very tiny spring steel wire it's like 260,000 psi that's the strength that's like four times the strength of steel and that approaches strengths of carbon fiber and glass fiber so super strong metal but think about embedding that for steel belted radial tires doable you have to think of a way to cut the metal when you're embedding it uh, if you're printing with it but um, this kind of technique that's fiber reinforced printing has been done so that's easy so how do you print um, we use Cura so let me let me share my screen here again so Cura we, we use Lulzbot Cura edition uh, but th this is the slicer software so you, you basically have a have a interface here you can put an STL file so let's take a look at example an example of useful okay I was looking at augers 3d printed augers now uh, this is actually comes out of now uh, uh, so we're building a saw mixer for for CB construction and we were doing a cement dosing auger that we're planning on 3D printing. But this is kind of stuff you put it into your print bed, you, you put your settings in. Uh, so what are the kind of settings you can change within a program? Like the, the main things, now this is actually, it's gray, so it's too tall to fit in a bed. So I'm going to just scale this down here. Um, so let's scale the Z down to like 0.5. Now see, this is, fits on a bed. So you got an auger for a cement dosing auger in our soil mixer, which we're planning to 3D print. Um, how do you print it? Settings, main setting is nozzle size. What nozzle are you printing with? 0.4, a lot of people do 0.4 for detail. Right now we're doing 
a lot for the larger parts for the CNC torch table, so larger nozzle. Uh, prints four times as fast as a .4 nozzle because it says R squared for the print speed, um, which means that a 1.2 millimeter nozzle, which uh, is much larger, using a volcano heater block, it prints nine times as fast as a .4, so that's one parameter. I mentioned about the percentage of layer height, so uh, layer height, um, let's go back to the .4 nozzle, you want to go to like .31 is the max it allows you before it gets uh, yellow here for a warning, but basically .3, .3 out of .4, that's 75% high, so that's, that's like the max you want to print for good layer adhesion, if you want finer detail, or better overhangs go to like 0.2 or for super detail like 0.1 whatever uh, we never do that around here maybe 0.2 we've done some as we were getting bad overhang properties on the uh, CNC torch table parts so uh, 0.2 uh, we're doing 0.4 layer height on a 0.8 nozzle okay infill fill density we typically do 20 percent as standard that's strong enough actually we, we printed the the parts that we will hang the big one inch axes for the cnc torch table which are going to weigh like 20 30 40 pounds um suspended of plastic pieces we, we still print them at 20 percent with a 0.8 millimeter nozzle the bigger the nozzle the stronger the print um the bigger the nozzle the more la interlayer adhesion you have and stronger the prints are uh, if you want super strong parts, go to 100%, but then take a look at your, your print times. The, the thing you're going to want to look at before you start getting crazy about printing things, you look at your nozzle size, your layer height, uh, fill density. But look at this, this auger, which is here about 8 inches tall. So this is about the size we'd want to print in real life. Uh, about 4 inches, about 8 inches tall. It's about 3, this one here is about 3 inches in diameter we want to probably do like two inch but this is comparable to what we want to print but look at that at a 0.4 nozzle with 0.2 layer height that takes 11 hours so uh, that's a lot of long time go to a point so we probably want to go with a 0.8 millimeter nozzle here and then did the time reduce when we're uh, not so much, it reduced down to six hours, half the time, we're at 0.2 layer height, which is still quite low. But we can go to like, say 0.5 or 0.6, not 0.7, but say 0.6, which is 75% uh, of the layer height, the, the, um, the nozzle size. But then you're getting down to two hours and 32 minutes here. That's quite attractive, so you can do this really quickly. You don't have to wait overnight, it's like later in the day you do that. Um, so that's, that's um, definitely a great difference. And then if you go to go with even a larger nozzle, like if this is an auger for moving cement into a, a mixer, for dosing cement into a soil mixer, I mean, you don't care about the fine resolution of this. You care about strength and speed of printing because it's a brute force structure. So go to... Here you'd want to go to say a 1.2 millimeter nozzle and a volcano block or a super volcano heater block. And what's the time get down to now? With 1.2 you can go to say 0.8 or 0.9 layer height quite acceptably. Uh, say 1.9596. 0 0.95 is the max it allows you. Look at the print time then. It's um, 1 hour 29 minutes. Very, it's going to be a very strong print. 20% uh, infill, so at that point you can probably be talking about larger infill, like 40%. If you want to here, like for an auger, I would go up to 100% um, infill. You're talking about possible jams when you're moving materials around, so you want this probably as strong as possible at 100% infill. But look at that, with a 1.2 millimeter nozzle, you're still at 2 hours and 53 minutes, which is quite acceptable for rapid prototyping of this so that's some of the things uh, other properties here we have is printing temperature uh, 230 you change that you modify that based on the exact properties of the of the filaments you're working with or sometimes it could be that your thermistor is not working right maybe or it's maybe offset a little bit so you you fine-tune a temperature but ideally you'd have uh, the same same temperature all the time for the same same material with the same printer 
Otherwise, there's, you're, you don't get reliable production engineering. Now, uh, what's the limit? Like if you talk about the large nozzles, one feature you have to pay attention to. Like right now, we're printing with 0.8 millimeter nozzles and you can see that um, it's, it's not too hot in this house here in the Hab Lab. We're, we've got probably like 10 Celsius, 10 to 20 something. We're kind of, when we heat it, you, you're nice room temperature, but it gets cool here if you don't heat the house. So at, in the winter where it's not like 90 Fahrenheit outside, it's cold and you get into the limits of how fast your heater block can extrude plastic. Right now at 0.8 millimeter nozzles, the you can see the the extruder heater you have a light on the control you can see when the extruder is on um it blinks for how the duty cycle of how how much it's on and how how much it's off but right now we're seeing that it's like duty cycle of it is about 90 percent 80 90 percent what does that mean that means that if we were to and we're printing at, at 50 millimeters per second so that means if we try to push the limits of that to either a larger nozzle which prints out more material or a faster print speed you're not going to be able to do it uh, without reducing the temperature down so it actually fails so if we can print well at at a 0.8 millimeter nozzle with about 90 percent duty cycle you only got a little bit of wiggle room for how fast you can go to print that so you couldn't print that at 100 millimeters per second it would be going too fast and it would be extracting the heat from the heater block too fast so you just can't print it more than about 50 millimeters per second at a 0.8 millimeter nozzle so right now I can tell you that if we tried a 1.2 millimeter nozzle uh, we would not be able to get it up to temperature because of the fast uh, extrusion rate and cold temperatures cold ambient temperatures uh, so that's some of the uh, things you have to w watch out for like temperatures do make a difference unless you've got enclosed building chambers um, speed here that we have like under you can set the speed like print speed here we're doing 50 millimeters per second but as I mentioned uh, for the 0.8 millimeter nozzle you can maybe go up to 60 millimeters per second but with our printers we're able to crank this up to, to 200 millimeters per second quite reliably uh, which is pretty fast let's see that graze it out even graze out uh, yellows out a hundred so typically the slower you print the higher the quality but if you want to accelerate that, go above 50. Um, so 60 is okay. So 70 is not okay. Um, but we go up to 200, per, um, 200 millimeters per second, which is 400% of the standard industry standard print speed while getting decent results on our printer. So that's that's pretty good. Um, but yeah, you can, uh, standard is 50. But you can definitely push it once you're pushing the production engineering limits. You you notice when things start to fail and keep it within a very safe range. Uh, 50 is deemed very very safe uh, but I think we'd like to go faster than that 100 or 200 as a safe range for for other prints if we want to just go faster um, platform adhesion here so if you look at this here in layers so this is what it actually slices it up as the first layer there's nothing on the first layer you can view the layer view uh, as such here but uh, we like to print without using any support because you don't waste time like for example doing a brim I'll do a brim of a few lines like say 10 lines around the base layer so what that means is that I can't really see it well let's look at layer one or two can I go to layer two it's not letting me show it but basically brim is where it prints extra lines on the bottom layer so that you can have better adhesion to the bat to the bed uh, that's important if you've got uh, a very small point of contact like for example to show you an example when we do the the frame so um, just to give you an example when you want to use brim versus not I'll comment on that because uh, if you're not using brim, you get cleaner prints. You don't have to clean off the feet. So let me see, uh, corner, corner, angle corner brackets. So these things, angle frame connector, we print them upside down on their corners like this because that's the best way you can print them. But what you'll see, so this way, if you print it on the one corner, it's very easy for it to come off the bed. So we start printing these on 
upside down like this so that there's more support points there's like six points of support but on those points of support like here we actually sunk it into the bed so you can have a setting cutoff object at the bottom you sink it and then add a little bit of brim so you have a bunch of brim around these points otherwise it could be very easy for this to come off the bed since it's only supported on points if you support on a whole flat side that's not an issue if you're printing it on corners it's going to be an issue so you want to use some brim there there's one useful feature in Cura uh, if you go to expert expert settings there's a thing called vase mode spiralize outer contour uh, you can click that on uh, in which case how does it do that here the, yeah it's not a good example here but spiralize outer contour would be that you're just printing the edge so you can print print a vase uh, so that's called vase mode it will print the bottom and it will print just the outer contour so you can print vases nicely uh, there's also another way to do this which we've been playing it here so I'm gonna actually show you a good example of a useful part of, of 3d printed bushing and the concept of vase mode so if you go to some wiki changes let's look at the, the up, upload um, spiral bearing <laughs> take a look at this so this is uh, uh, we just generated this as an open source file based on another non open source design here this is an open SCAD open source when you print this this you can print this this is a solid object but when you, you can set it so you print only the outer contour how do you do that you can do it in two ways one you can enable the vase mode in advanced settings but that would actually I believe vase mode also still prints the bottom so that wouldn't work here because we want this to be a bushing for eight millimeter rods so this is a cool thing we're just exper experimenting with this see if this is completely practical for um, instead of buying the bushings if we can 3d print them uh, the second way besides the vase mode within Cura is to do another thing in Cura so let's go to that let me download this to show you um, so this thing is under D3D Universal that's our current current working version of the 3D printer spiral linear bearing parametric so download the zip file and you'll get an open open SCAD file and the STL in there possibly so extract okay so that's an open SCAD file so we open up open SCAD and export so so you see this is a solid object here actually uh, and we're gonna print it just as an outer contour which is very useful so I'm gonna generate uh, render it then do I have to press that let's generate an STL so click STL spiral linear bearing dot STL it'll uh, export that as STL from open SCAD so this is fully parametric you can mess with this uh, you can do change the outer diameter, the length here, nozzle diameter, number of teeth, tooth angle. We can change all of that, yeah, Chris? Nice. So we fully parametric bearing. You can. Uh, we're going to actually explore doing this for one inch rods as well. We're testing that out with eight millimeter rods. How well this works. Uh, but we save that. So save that and then go into Cura. let's not do the layer view let's do the normal view okay there it is there's that thing but let me trash this uh, this other thing so we've got this bearing that's that's a solid so how do you get that to print just as an outer contour so you can do this by simply saying uh, in a, under let's see where is that basic fill density zero so let's look at now how it slices that and let's look at the layers so you see it's just printing the spiral itself by setting the infill to zero so that's a trick you can play within Cura uh, by setting fill density to be nothing inside that that means you're just printing the outer contour so that's a way you can print this this bearing um, from a solid object and then you can select uh, you can play with because sometimes it's actually hard if you were to print that as a sh geometrical shape not the solid 
uh, it would be really tricky to get the the settings right so it prints it just as like one pass it prints it very fast one pass it takes eight minutes right now to print one of these um, but what happens here is whatever nozzle so say you're printing this with 0 0.4 which is what we've done um, you got zero fill density what's bottom top thickness what is that going to be zero two or no yeah yeah so you don't want a bottom and top so you want to select bottom and top thickness to be zero no top or bottom um, because for this particular geometry you want this flexible um, bushing that looks like this as a 3d object but when you're actually printing it looks ju it's just the, the contour that you're printing so that's that's it for a nice trick for how to do this. Let's talk about uh, the bed surface. So in our printer right now, our bed goes to 187 stable working C, 187 C stable working temperature, which is higher than just about anything out there. Uh, and it's a fast heated insulated bed. Now we notice that you have to get the bed temperatures right. So you can get the bed hot for some materials if you're using um, if you're using polyetheramide, PEI, print surface, which is a good surface which where when you heat it up, PLA sticks well to it. When you cool it off, it pops pretty much readily off. There's a, uh, there's a feature you have to pay attention to, and that, that is getting the bed too hot. What we've noticed is, um, so you can print at, say, like 60... C or 80 C we've, that's what we've been do, doing here 60 or 80 C for the print bed uh, on our printer but if you get it up higher like a hundred they'll be so hot that the bottom layer is still kind of molten that the print will simply not stick so for the bed temperature you also want to have an optimal temperature it can't be too hot because this print won't stick to it if you're using P so we're, we're talking about PEI surface which is the industry standard for decent uh, for pretty high quality printing where you don't have to use any like painters tape or any adhesive substances for prints to stick to the bed uh, so yeah we've been doing a lot of ADC but if we, we notice that if we get it higher the prints just don't stick to it which is kind of counterintuitive I initially thought that oh the hotter you get the better they'll stick but if you think about it if you're getting into the near the melting temperature of the plastic well naturally it's not gonna stick to the bed anymore because it's just melting off so with a high performance print bed, be careful about getting your bed too hot. Uh, print temperature is about 230 in our case. Okay, so another feature about uh, 3D printing, production engineering, you want to have your bed stationary, otherwise you cannot print tall columnar objects. So let's take this bushing here, and what if we wanted to print it like in a Z, Z direction, make it like, um, eight inches tall like a tall very very tall one well if the bed is moving back and forth in the Prusa style printers uh, you're gonna start messing up the layers at a certain height because of the moving bed and the whole structure will be shaking on you so what's more desirable for production engineering is that the gantry moves and the bed stays stationary it can only just move up and down so that's the design we have and therefore we can print very tall objects without limits as to how tall they can be they will still be perfectly stable on a 3d printer because the bed is not moving so when you when you use a 3d printer be careful what design you have as far as what capacity that printer has if you have a moving bed you cannot print tall columnar objects unless you go super slow which defeats defeats the purpose because printing is already 3d printing is already slow enough you don't you don't want to slow it down even more okay um, talked about uh, the practical limits of 3D printing. I mentioned in another talk uh, presentation here that without a heated chamber you, you can do PLA, you can do TPU, the, the rubber like filaments, you can do PETG, but if you're printing large objects and any other plastics that are high temperature, pretty much forget about like a large large thin walled structure in ABS, it's gonna warp on you without a heated chamber. So uh, 3D printing is li limited in that sense right now, so you got to go to heated chambers. Now, there is one trick you can play, and that is the, the fiber reinforced filaments that are nylon or other ones that are more high temperature reinforced with fiber. Those actually do not warp because of the fiber in there. So you can actually have some very high performance prints using fiber reinforced filaments with carbon fiber or glass fiber 
but the rolls of that that filament are get expensive like around a hundred bucks a roll or so or 60 bucks a pound yeah it gets pretty high for the fiber reinforced filaments not not so affordable but doable for some purposes so next let's talk briefly about materials I mentioned so you can print rubber you can print um, polycarbonate but once again that's higher temperature so forget about an unenclosed printer but polycarbonate for glazing and protective structures like helmets uh, fi as I mentioned, the fiber reinforcement gets your prints to be stable without a heated chamber. Um, there's also gliding filaments, like, uh, like for example, what what the IGUS glide bearings, linear bearings are made of. You can actually print in that. That's higher temperature once again, so forget about it in a low, without a heated chamber. Uh, but those materials do exist for higher temperatures. Um, then at the upper level, did you know that even PEI, the surface that you can print on, is a thermoplastic? So you can actually think about if you have a high temperature chamber, you can be printing your 3D printing surface, the high performance PEI surface, from filament that you get off the shelf. Once again, around when you talk about raw resin, and say you're making raw filament from um, a ton of resin that you get from China uh, for a dollar a pound, yeah, you can be printing your own. PEI surfaces and, and other high performance objects out of plastics like PEI or PEAK uh, and other things that withstands hundred, like a couple of hundred degrees Celsius are their working temperatures or higher um, as opposed to like PLA which starts to deform at about 60 C. Okay, um, so let's get into in the production engineering that we've been talking about. Let's get into quality control and what, what's, what's critical for quality control. So you have to keep things the same to get re replicable results. If you're going to do quality control for reliable results between prints, then you have to consider a number of, number of things that have to be the same between the, in the system. You first of all have to be using the same machine to be printing, otherwise you might get slightly different results. Uh, you have to use the same CAD files naturally, like um, you want to share CAD files, so you, you do the same, same, print the same object. But even if you have the same CAD file, there could be a difference in the slicer. So here we're using Cura, but if you slice it in a different slicer, it might. Uh, slicer is the uh, the way you're dividing this. You 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 make the pr 3D printer head go in order to print this. There's many ways you can f you can do this. It's not just like whatever pattern. If you see in the layer view here. And let's do fill density 100% here. So here, this algorithm is selecting a particular print pattern for each layer, like how it goes. But you can fill that in in many ways. You can fill it as a square, squares, uh, hex hexagons. You can fill it as like circles or whatever. So there's different algorithms you can do. So even from the same file, you can get different different slicers can perform different things. So you may not necessarily get the same results. So if you if you do print, you would have to have the same G code. So not only the STL file, but the slicing, which is turned into G code as the machine code that you're actually running. So you have to have that the same. Um, so, so the tool chain could look like you're designing in FreeCAD, you export the STLs, you slice it in Cura. But also beyond this, there's all these settings like temperatures and nozzle sizes and all of that that have to be the same as well. So that's captured in a .ini profile file. So here in QR you can export, you can save this profile, all the properties of the printer that you have. Uh, you can save them as the official, okay, this is how I print this thing. You have to have all those settings, otherwise you, you might get different prints like layer height. You know, it might fail at a certain layer height, it might print well. At a smaller layer height and so forth so you have to save all those um, properties therefore what it turns out is that for large-scale collaboration the only way there's two ways you can do this like everyone have this have the same degenerate tool set um, so that's doable in open source but it's also doable in a complete 1984 control society when there's only only one way to do things so our option is here either to use open source or be in a monopoly system where one company produces all the printers and produces all the software and all of that uh, and has a complete 100% monopoly um, with Gini Coefficient 1. Uh, okay, that Gini Coefficient 1 is an absolute monopoly. In that, in that scenario, you've got um, 
the ability to print things uniformly because you're under a completely controlled system. But that's kind of not likely to happen because diversity is a natural thing that happens. So, uh, so therefore, it's more likely that you will end up with uh, distributed production engineering, not in a monopoly system, but in an open source distributed economy. So that's just a semi-political statement there. Uh, but for large-scale collaboration, what we're saying here, the point that it, of that is that if you're using open source tool chains with open source machines and you're uploading that to public repositories that's a way that you can have a large distributed effort gain, getting the identical results in a distributed way which is not really happening right now um, you know that still needs work in today's economy for us to, to get to a distributed production economy but that is doable but you'd have to settle on some, some standards and ways to do things that are degenerate that you know you're choosing one way to do it that's ideally optimized and mo most robust so that everyone can get the same results and it becomes super practical to make all your household objects or other objects with reliable results so how do you get to this distributed quality control like which we plan on with all within OSE um, we're introducing the concept of distributed quality control which means how do we get many people worldwide to produce reliable objects for your open source everything store or for Amazon that you get replicable results that's a hard problem uh, but as I mentioned with all the same um, the degeneracy of the system here you have to have same everything and if we're going to to create an organization based on distributed production we would have to build in certain certification mechanisms and standards that support this and support infrastructure to, to to do this so for example if somebody wants to get certified to produce these bearings they they can use an open source 3d printer um, for for our purposes because we're using our printers they would have to use do that with our printer because you would or a derivative of our printer where we know uh, the properties of the system we're printing with um, if you for example, if, if we're going into distributing production to many, many people worldwide, one way to do that is you can produce video documentation of how you're doing that. People can replicate that. People can send, send you samples. Say you're a certifying agency like OSC, say we become a certifying agency. You can send us a sample of your result. Okay, how exactly did you print it? And we can take measurements on it and say, okay, you, you've printed it correctly to these specs. We can certify that and provide certification for distributed production so um, machine design so for example with our 3d printer we would have an official version that's the production version that everyone uses for the purpose of production because I mean in open source you have many many variations because everyone can build their whatever version and especially with a construction set approach you can build many different variants of our tools but we would say that okay if you we're going into official distributed manufacturing we say, okay, here's our production machine, the official D3D Pro version of our printer. Here are our best practices of how we print. Here are our printer profiles and design files and settings that everyone can get, uh, get replicable results. Now, there's a couple of things missing in that whole system, I would say, um, uh, that prevents distributed manufacturing from happening today. And I would say the, the number one thing is uh, currently there's a lack of an open source open source high temperature print chamber 3d printer and that's actually our next frontier that we want to develop is a high quality simply enclosed chamber so you're talking about build chamber temperatures that are like a hundred or degrees celsius or higher uh, for polycarbonate for peak for pei for high any high temperature materials for nylon for um, polycarbonate abs pvc anything that can print now as as any kind of shape in a controlled environment in a high temperature chamber you really need that and that's the missing link that uh, that reduces current pretty 3d printing capacity to reliable printing only with the low temperature materials like like PLA and not even really ABS so PLA PTG and TPU are uh, and fiber reinforced filaments which there can be many variants of but uh, for practical purposes we have only scratched the surface of what's doable in practice for all the different materials like you can't do polyethylene you cannot do polypropylene very common materials um, I mean it's just not doable with it with tight control of your heat, heated 
build environment so things simply don't work. Um, or you can, I mean, the caveat is yes, you can do that, but all, all those materials, and that's why all the 3D printer makers advertise it, but you can print, print with them only in very limited cases where everything is just right. You cannot just take any shape and print it. Uh, the other thing that I want to inform the public about is that um, the missing piece is that there is currently no three, 3D printer extruder that works well with 3 millimeter rubber. There is a flexion extruder optimized for 1.75 millimeter rubber, soft rubbers, I think down to like a durometer, I heard, what is it, like 65 or so. Um, but that's missing for the 3 millimeter version. Uh, at least I haven't seen one, so we're going to be building one as well. And also another missing piece that we have to talk about is, is the repositories of, of designs with verified production engineering. So yes, Thingiverse is there, but you'll get variable results depending on the kind of printer and settings you have. So getting that more refined for distributed production engineering is a big step that we can work on um, so that we, we um, basically have the ability to produce very reli reliably uh, with any material for anything that's out there uh, in the plastic economy, the, the polymer economy that is quite limited at this point. So this was to cover mostly the plastic area of 3D printing. But that's about all. So those are some considerations out of many regarding production engineering. If we were talking about true distributed manufacturing, which we've only scratched the surface off in terms of humanity in general, but lots of work to be done and thinking about collaborative design on a massive scale, that's the next step. I mean, imagine uh, that society uh, enables various mechanisms where you have an idea, you can join a group because everyone's designing collaboratively and in a week's, week's time you create any like new design. That's actually what we're trying to do with the, the steam camps in the five project days there. So you have a bunch of people collaborating say 500 people across you know 12 events worldwide um, so developing the collaborative literacy the the collaborative tools to do that and developing on a rapid time scale of say five days okay design a new car design a bicycle design a new electric motor or whatever design a, a trencher for your tractor where you're now prototyping with with steel and CNC torch tables, not only plastic. I mean, that's all doable, but society today does not know how to, say, take a, a large group of people, give them machines, give them design tools, and actually have a meaningful design process with hundreds of, or thousands of people, like I talked about in a collaborative literacy uh, presentation, people that are actually designing collaboratively effectively. So we're working on that. I think that's going to be nat pretty much natural. Um, Okay, I'm recording here still, my internet went out. That will be a natural capacity of humanity, probably in the future. We're not there yet because people are only merely waking up to the potential of distributed collaborative design for a transparent and inclusive economy of abundance. So that's what we're working on um, and we'll continue. My internet popped out, but you can hear this here. Um, that I think will be, in my prediction, it will be a norm for a few years into the future once, once the society learns about collaborative design and, and open source tools that can enable that to be truly the Star Trek replicator becoming real in real life. Uh, I think that's somewhat inevitable as the tools and techniques get better, but the most important part there is for people to understand that by collaboration we can do more than just by ourselves and with patents and all of that. So I'll leave it at that. Please send comments below and thank you for listening. Take care.